Hi, I'm Maria Rana, Literary Director of the Library of Congress. It's a great pleasure to welcome you back to this edition of Hear You, Hear Me, part of National Book Festival Presents, a series that keeps you abreast of and engaged in the wealth of ideas and inspiration that books can bring us, especially when we need ideas and inspiration most. Today, we're fortunate to have two writers who are integrally related to the work we do at the Library of Congress. They are United States Poets Laureate, Tracy K. Smith, who held the post between 2017 and 2019, and our current Poet Laureate, Joy Harjo, two extraordinarily talented artists who come from two different corners of America and two very different histories. All the same, they join together to talk about what unites them what we have in common. U.S. Poets Laureate date back to 1937, and they mark our country's deep respect for words, poetry, and the truths that a poem artfully composed and deeply felt can tell us about the human experience. Tracy K. Smith was born in Falmouth, Massachusetts, and raised in California, the daughter of a space engineer and a school teacher. Joy Harjo is a member of the Muscogee, or Creek tribe, born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. These are two far-flung origins, profoundly different American experiences, and yet the two meet in a common place, poetry, and in their deep regard for what poetry can give us. Tracy has offered us a striking abundance of poems in a number of books, Duende, American Journal, Life on Mars, and Wade in the Water, Joy has given us a great many unforgettable collections, among them, How We Became Human, She Had Some Horses, Crazy Brave, and most recently, An American Sunrise. Here to interview them is the 14th Librarian of Congress, herself a spokesperson for how words can bring us together. Please welcome Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden. Thank you, Marie. It's my honor to be joined today by two brilliant poet laureates, Joy Harjo and Tracy K. Smith. We titled our special series, Hear You, Hear Me, and it's from a poem by Langston Hughes, Theme for English B. And I'd like to just read a passage. It's not easy to know what is true for you or me but I guess I'm what I feel and see and hear. Harlem, I hear you. Hear you, hear me, we too. You, me, talk on this page. So I wanna ask both of you, what do you think is the role of poets, especially during this historic time in our country? Well, I think the role of poets always is to listen, um, to listen for voices, but also for different versions of truth and possibility, and to amplify them through our work, to use those other sources of insight as tools for getting to um, truth and better, better uh recognition of, of who and what we are. And now I think that's especially important. I know many of us are choosing to use the voices, the public voices that we have to do that work outwardly, um, to, to think together with readers and listeners um, <clears throat> about what America is, how we could be Enjoy a poet and a musician now at this time. Yes. Well, I think about, you know, everybody, we all have tools that we were given to use. And we're at a time of, it's a great time of incredible challenge, and which means incredible possibility. And we're standing at a fracture. There's a tremendous fracture in this country. It didn't just happen. It's been here, you know, since the beginning, actually a fracture that came about with words. You could even say it came about with words and, and actions. 
And so I think about, well, what do you do with this fracture? You know, you can say a po sing across it, say a poem. You know, we it's it's about you know healing. And I think about how in a lot of our indigenous language, the word the po a poet is a speaker or a singer. And often those speaker singers are the healers. You know, poetry is is I, I like what Tracy said. It's about listening, and uh, that's the biggest part of <laughs> being a poet. Is most of it is listening, and uh, and so we're we've been listening for a long time, and our words come out of it's poetry for me, and I think for many of us, poetry is a way to speak when you have no words. I mean. How can you put all of this in words? We try. These, we see these images. We see things happening that, you know, in my generation, we thought we had taken at least taken care of it to some extent. And then here there's a rupture. And so we say, OK, we have more work to do. Now, poets are known to be uh, especially sensitive uh, to ideas and, and thoughts and and everything that's in their environment. Um, how is this affecting you both personally? Mm. And has your writing been affected? Because this is quite a time. Yeah, well, um, I will say that I feel a lot of pain. I feel rage. I feel um, a sense of urgent calling to help in some way. I feel a uh, the burden that I think many people of color feel in general, and especially at times of crisis, to try and help people who don't understand why we are so worried and adamant to help them understand what, what's going on as we see it. Um, and that means using my voice as a poet, but in lots of different forums, you know, making making statements, writing letters, speaking about, um, about issues and conditions. Um, it's draining, but it's also exhilarating. I find that right now when I'm doing all of those other things and don't have the quiet, private, luxurious focus that I choose to seek out when I want to write a poem, I'm actually writing more poems than I have in a long time. So um, I, I believe that the time is, is waking something up within us and giving or imparting a kind of energy to rise to the task. Joy? Yes, I, I, I've been in the middle of it, too, with family and and uh, history, you know, looking at history and well, all of the stories. So I've been I've been called. A lot of people are asking me about poems and I've been in the middle of a memoir called For Justice, For Love, which is looking back through history, through, you know, the history, my the Muskogee Creek history, the history of this country and, you know, the history of becoming a poet. You know, with those poets who took care of me, like Audre Lorde and June Jordan and, you know, Leslie Silka, who's more known as a novelist, but she was also a poet and she was there. And Meridel Lesseur, you know, great, great poet, writer and others along the way and looking at their lives, looking at my teachers. And, and uh, some of the teachers are um, some are musicians um, and saying thank you and looking at the lessons they've taught me. And I think it comes down like Langston Hughes knows, well, you know, we come to these times, you know, and what are we going to do? You know, we use, we use the tools that we have and I think it's possible. I'm not going to give up. I have, you know, all the children are ours. All the great ch the grandchildren are ours. I was just spent time this morning with my, even my great grandchildren. And you look at them and I see they're all of us, <laughs> you know, I see, I see everybody in them. And I think, okay, well, it's going to go on, you know, what we're teaching them with with our lives, how we, you know, how we live our lives. And, um, but sometimes the fury, what do you do with it? Yeah. I'm still trying to figure it out. I think I, as a kid, a younger, when well, I was in my 20s, and I started writing. I think I came to write, to poetry. I didn't want to be a poet. I was going to be a painter. And, but it's what helped me deal with, with fury. I started writing during native rights movements with the fury, with the love, the tremendous love that, the tremendous love that got people that, you know, made, got people, you know, 
freed people that freed us within our you know spirits and our souls to go on no matter what hell tracy your beautiful poem uh, unrest in baton rouge mm. speaks to some of that would you mind reading oh, a it for me i'd love to i mean that poem was written in response to you know similar incidents um, black unarmed black citizens dying and um, the outrage against those attempting to peacefully protest. Um, I wanted to figure out something that could help me make a better kind of sense than um, I felt was being made. And, and so this poem counterintuitively, I think, invoked love. Um, and I think love is a challenge. Unrest in Baton Rouge. Our bodies run with ink dark blood. Blood pools in the pavement's seams. Is it strange to say love is a language? Few practice, but all or near all speak. Even the men in black armor, the ones jangling handcuffs and keys. What else are they so buffered against, if not love's blade, sizing up the heart's familiar meat? We watch and grieve. We sleep, stir, eat. Love, the heart sliced open, gutted, clean. Love, naked almost, in the everlasting street, skirt, lifted by a different kind of breeze. When I read that poem now, and I think about so many uh, statements of attack essentially that are saying, those of us who want to push America to do better don't love America. I think, no, you're missing it, perhaps willfully so. We love this nation, we belong to this nation and we want to help it. Uh, love is what fuels so much of the, the action and so many of the statements that poets and others are making at this time. Mm -hmm. And the poems help us uh, get from that heartbreak and the anger. Both of you mentioned uh, those, those strong feelings and that getting to love. How do, mm -hmm. What does it take? Yeah. And you both are doing it. And Tracy, I'll, I have to say during your time as poet laureate, you visited rural areas in our country. And during this time with the division, it seems to be definitely front and center. How were you able to use poetry to bridge some of those divisions? Because you were in some different areas mm -hmm. of the country. Yeah, I was very conscious in different trips that I was in spaces where my values were not necessarily the values that people who were present at the events held. And yet, every single one of those trips felt like a vulnerable, honest um, engagement with strangers that was characterized by goodwill, good faith. You know, I think a poem, when you are sitting down to listen to it and, and let it speak to you, is an invitation to act in good faith. And I think that somehow doing that with others, even with strangers, um, or maybe especially with strangers, um, it was so beautiful. I, I, I wish that there was a way to do more community facing um, programming. But of course, you know, we're constrained in that regard now. Tracy uh, in Alabama. Can you help me? Kentucky, perhaps. Oh, Kentucky. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of, I mean, Kentucky was a really amazing trip. And there were a lot of things that, um, that stand out in my memory about that time. One uh, sort of general one was meeting people who said, I came from far away. I drove for hours to get here because I come from a community they're my children. <laughs> I come from a community that's racially divided and I want my kids to be here and think differently. Um, or uh, a specific encounter that we had with a young girl in a, in a public library in, in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky, who said, 
you have stories? How did you know you had stories to tell? I think I have stories to tell. And even just the invitation to view your life as a space that contains, you know, narrative and, and shareable information. I think that's, um, that's beautiful. And it's beautiful to um, be greeted by listeners who are willing to feel that way about what I'm sharing. And they wanted to change too, or mm -hmm. think about a future. And Joy, you're going to, your project, Living Nations, Living Words, a map of first people's poetry. Your project will hopefully help the country see Native people as living through their poetry and tying it into social justice. Could you elaborate more on that? Because it flows directly to what Tracy was doing too in terms of this. Right, it's all about community, you know, and you can't, you know, and at the middle of, I think of at the middle of any power center is vulnerability and listening and the ability and, 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 and the inclusion. We cannot have, I think the difference, I keep think, hearing that clanking of metal of the, you know, tools of destruction in your poem and thinking of, and then yet there's a heart, somebody's got a heart. There's a heart in there somewhere. And uh, I think for natives in this country, we, we deal with this, invisibility or people only seeing us if we're, you know, like the Washington Redskins, which means Redskins is a word for bounty giving, you know, it's a dead, a Redskin is the body of a dead Indian brought in for bounty. And yet, you know, that's what we're dealing with. And we're also dealing with, there was a study done by um, a group in Eliminative. We finally have uh, some data to go with, um, you know, the stories of Nate, it's another kind of story making data, is that a lot of, a huge percentage, I forget the percent of Americans feel, think that we're gone, that we don't exist anymore. Or if we, uh, because that's how it is in the American narrative, is we were we were here in some mid distant misty past and then we were, we were gone. And yet we are here and that's the point of the project is like, hey, you know, we're here. When I became the poet laureate, it's like, whoa, yeah, we're poets, we're jazz musicians, we're teachers, we're, you know, we're human beings. And I remember when I first started writing poetry and I thought if I, and we were in the middle of, you know, native rights movements, that's what my poetry started out of. It's like, yeah, we're human beings. And I thought if I do anything else with my life or with my poetry is that people see that we are human beings. We have cultures, we have language, we have, you know, we've, we've contributed, but we're often diminished one because if we are here, it means the story of America needs a little fixing up. <laughs> you know, how it's see here. Yeah. I'm looking at your, your poem, Exile of Memory. That could you read a passage from that? Because it, it really speaks to what you were just saying. Okay, yeah, I'll read. Uh, it's in several sections, so I'm just going to read the first and then the the quatrain at the at the end. And this was um, I was back in our homelands. We were moved into Indian Territory, or Oklahoma, in here in Tulsa, where I am now. And Tulsa is um, it it the derivative of the word means town, actually, in the Muscogee language. And Anyway, I'd gone back to our homelands in the south, in the southeast, which is Alabama, Georgia, and so on. And and this happened. I, I remember some of the old people saying, "Don't go back. If you go back, you will open up the grief. You will you will open up that cauldron of, of gr grief. What happens? Some people don't survive it. You know, some people don't survive that cauldron of anger. Or you know, how can you, you know, just be forced out by gunpoint?" You know, we had nice houses. It wasn't like we were hiding in the trees and whatever. We, it was, it wasn't, uh, anyway, exile of memory. Do not return. We were warned by one who knows things. You will only upset the dead. They will emerge from the spiral of little houses lined up in the furrows of marrow and walk the land. There will be no place in memory for what they see. The highways, the houses, the stores of interlopers perched over the blood fields where the dead last stood. And then what you with your words in the enemy's language, do you know how to make a peaceful road through human memory? And what if angry ghosts of history? 
then what? In the last stanza, I sing my leaving song. I sing it to the guardian trees, this beloved earth, to those who stay here to care for a memory. I will sing it until the day I die. For you and for both. Um, and Tracy, I mentioned your, your article, Dear Black America. Uh, do you feel hopeful uh, that this seems to be a transformative time in the history of uh, the Native people and African Americans? I choose to feel hopeful. I choose to feel heartened that the large number of people who are taking these questions to heart for the first time will remain active in, in this consciousness. Um, I have little kids. Um, when I feel tired of the work it is to keep going, I look at them and I think I have to be hopeful. Enjoy. You mentioned a great grandchild mm -hmm. gives you inspiration. And yeah. hope, hopefully. That's it. I mean, that's it. And then you learn, you get older, like I'm a great grandmother. That gives me a little authority now. <laughs> but uh, is that is that you start seeing how the, the story field or the ancestral field, and it starts to become more and more visible. And then you realize that it is it is like a tree. It's a field of meaning. And there's no, somebody might go on, but they're still connected. It's like you still, you know, your mother might go, but that cord, that mother cord is still here. The grandmother cord is still here. The great grandmother cord. And then it goes. And like my memoir that I just wrote, just well, finished, I'll be doing other drafts for Justice for Love ends with an image. It was a dream. I'm a, I dream a lot of things that happen or that. And in the dream, I was holding my seventh generation granddaughter. And I looked at her and I said, you look kind of, you look Japanese. And I thought, now you look like your aunt, your grandmother, Rainy. It was interesting to think of my daughter, my daughter. I said, you look like your great, 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 great grandmother, Rainy. And then I carried her into this world. So, yes. I do. I mean, despite it all, we have to keep, we, we, we have to plant, you know, that's what Langston Hughes did. So he planted love. He planted a way for, you know, his work has inspired so many people. You know, he planted and that's, I, I, I'm hopeful. I mean, it doesn't mean we're not going to go through more stuff, you know, in the wound because the wounding is deep and it involves all of us. It involves shifting the story too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Telling you. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask you both this because I am a librarian mm -hmm. and I know that you are working and doing and creating, but are you having any time to read yourself and what are you possibly reading? You mentioned Langston Hughes and going back and thinking about that or what are you all reading both if you have? Yeah, I'm reading different things. It's harder. My attention has changed right now because of just all of the anxiety in the world. But I, I um, I'm, have recently read Danez Smith's new book of poems called Homey, which I think is a perfect book for this time. And it's a both a you know call to awakening for this country, but it's also a love letter to the joy of community within the Black community. Um, and my colleague, Ruha Benjamin at Princeton has a book called Race After Technology, which talks about the ways that questions of prejudice, bias, um, and sort of like surrender to perspectives that we don't necessarily agree with, um, how technology is driving a lot more than we, <laughs> than we bargained for. So, yeah, I was turning around all my, some of my books are stacked here and they made me move my camera because I had them over there, but I'm. Toni Morrison's the the source of self regard. I'm taking moment by moment. I keep going back and forth, and then I just got that Frederick Douglass uh, biography by uh, David Blight. And then I'm talking to a lot. You know, I like the the older people. I'm talking to a lot of people, the older people of our tribe. I mean, they're almost all gone. You realize then you're the older people, so you better get it together. And then Esperanza Spalding has been writing a um, uh, an opera. She's been working with Wayne Shorter. So I've been reading her drafts. 
Wow. Ifer Ifer yeah, was Ifer Genia. So I've been doing that and um, a bunch of other stuff I've been reading too. It gives oh, you right. a sense of, uh, and people look to poets, and, and we know uh, during these times for that security, some inspiration. And if you could, and we're going to, of course, be broadcasting this about. What would you like to tell the public? Because people will be listening and want to hear from both of you. If you and Tracy, you're, you did a letter. Dear Black America. Yes, that was great. Yeah, I mean. I read it and said, oh, this, oh. it was inspirational as a person of color. Mm -hmm. Well, so much of the uh, speaking and public thinking that many of us who are Black are called to do right now is essentially a white America. And I wanted to make a deliberate turn and to embrace the community that I belong to and that I believe is reviving and rescuing this country and to just share that love. Um, I think that if I were gonna make a, a general statement, I would say people turn to poems for consolation. And now especially, I think it's important to remember that sometimes that comes through discomfort, pain, uh, um, unpleasant self-reflection. And I think that's the work that we're being called to do, to seek consolation in the willingness to do those difficult things for the, the greater good. And poetry can do that. Mm -hmm. And George, what, what would you say? Oh man. So the truth, the thing, I, it's interesting when you write a, writing a memoir, and we are kind of writing the memoir of the country because it is made up of everybody's memories. It's a collective memoir. It's the truth. You, you start digging into memory, and it, the hardest parts are the ones that have the most to teach you. And so it's important to, and I, I keep thinking about the young woman in your audience in Kentucky, that girl asking about, you know, her story, or did she, we all are part of this. American story and our, our, you know, you may not see, you know, you rarely see natives as part of the American story, but every one of us has a place here. So it's really important that everybody investigate the truth. You know, a lot of people don't even know their grandparents' names or their great grandparents or, you know, investigate the truth of the story. Some of it is painful, you know, what, what we do to each other. And it's often within our own families, you know, but those stories, it's all important. I mean, if we were to walk around the whole story, walk around all of the memory and gather it in, you know, it, it's painful. It's powerful. It's it, there's an, you know, when you walk through the, the the story field with a vulnerability, when you make it out the other side, it's so even as if, even if it's you can you know hear the blood talking on the ground. You make it through, and it, it not only empowers you. But you're part of everyone else. It empowers, ultimately, it can empower everyone. Well, I want to thank you on behalf of uh, the people who are viewing you both and getting some inspiration and some hope during this time. And poetry, I believe, can help us and give us a place to put feelings and to express them. So I wanna thank both of you for this. And I have to tell you, I will be looking at and picking up some of the books that you both recommended during this time. So thank you and stay well. You too. Thank you.